So in section 5.2, we're going to look at calculating theoretical probabilities. And that's mostly what we're going to work with for the rest of the chapter, is looking at theoretical probabilities. So our objectives here at the top, find the theoretical probabilities of equally, oops, let me use a red pen instead, equally likely events. Um, find the probability of the complement complement of an event and use some basic probability rules. So what do we mean by an event? First of all, an event is, um, let's see, I'm going to get rid of a set here. I'm going to say event is something occurring, so something occurring during uh, an experiment, get rid of the word of, of an experiment um, to which probability is assigned. So an event could be anything, the event that it's going to rain, uh, the event that a coin will land on heads, um, the event that will make a particular sale in, in some sort of business setting. Anything that could happen during an experiment that we assign a probability to is considered an event. We're going to use uppercase letters to denote events. And to talk about the probability of an event A, for example, the notation, we use capital P of A. So that would be the probability of event A occurring. Probabilities, so the probability of an event A is always going to be between 0 and 1. So probabilities, you're always going to describe them in terms of 0 to 1. Uh, 0 would be the probability that an event never happens. In fact, that's the line down here. An event A has a probability of 0 if it can never happen. An event A has a probability of 1 if it is certain to happen. So these would also be equivalent to percentages. So if you think of a decimal between 0 and 1, that could also be thought of as a percentage. So 1 would be 100% chance, 0 would be 0% chance. The sum of all possible probabilities of an experiment is 1. So all of your probabilities of any event that could occur during an experiment has to add up to 1 or 100%. We can expe express probability as either a fraction between 0 and 1, a decimal between 0 and 1, or the percent version of that decimal. So the first example, explain which of the following cannot be probabilities. Well, probabilities have to be between 0 and 1. So 0.75 is okay, 0.001 would be okay, 110% is over 100%, so that's not a possibility. Probabilities can't be negative, or 150%, and then again, it has to be between 0 and 1, so 5.61 is not possible. So those three are not possible probability values. The complement of an event, so the complement of event A is the event that A does not happen. So a complement of an event is the probability that the event does not happen. The notation that our textbook uses for this is A, a capital A, with a little C in the exponent slot. So the probability of an event not occurring, probability that A does not occur, is going to be equal to 1 minus the probability that A does occur. Notationally, we could say the probability of the complement of A would be 1 minus the probability of A. And this should really make sense to you if you think of it in terms of an everyday example. I keep going back to the probability that it's going to rain. So if the news says the probability that it's going to rain today is 30%, the complement would be the, the event that it does not rain, and so the probability that it does not rain would be 70%, right? 1 minus the percent, so, or 100 minus percentage, if you're thinking of it that way. Here's a quick example. Toss a fair coin. If A is the event that the coin ends on heads, what is the complement? So they're just asking for the event itself, not the probability. So the complement of this event would be, so A complement is that the coin does not land on heads. And I realize that would be that it would land on tails, so we could certainly say it that way, but I prefer that you say, think of it as the complement is the event not happening. So in this case, it would be that the coin does not land on heads. All right, let's take a look at this example. Wait for a trolley outside the fort and, and note its arrival time. 
if A is the event that the trolley arrives on time, then what is A complement? So that would be that the event that the trolley, trolley does not arrive on time. Again, think of it in the negative of what the event is, because there could be other events that are occurring. Um, and so we always want to think of it as the negative of the event we're interested in. Next one, a uh, hurricane hits St. Augustine. The, a, if the probability of event A in this case is 60%, what is AC and what's its complement? Or what is the probability rather? So the complement, first of all, would be what? That a hurricane does not hit St. Augustine. And so the probability of A complement would be 1 minus the probability of A, which was 60%. So in this case, that would be 40%. All right, sample space. What do we mean by sample space? So the sample space, let's fill that in here. The sample space is the set of all possible equally likely outcomes of an experiment. Um, I guess they don't have to be equally likely. It's just all of the things that could happen in the experiment. Uh, so anything that could occur, that's going to be our sample space. An event we can think of as any collection of outcomes in the sample space. So it could be a couple of those events occurring. Let's do an example. I think this will make more sense. So find the sample space for rolling a, six, a fair six-sided die is what they mean. So the sample space, we usually use capital S to denote it, and a lot of times we'll use this bracket notation and then we'll list the, the events that are part of the sample space. So that would be one, two, three, four, five, or six. So all of the possibilities for rolling a six-sided die that it could land on one, two, three, four, five, six. I said all possibilities, all events. It could land on any one of those six numbers. Find the outcomes for event A. So they're calling event A rolling an odd number. So first of all, what are the outcomes for event A? Well, which of these are, raw, are odd numbers? So that would be 1, 3, or 5. Notice that is a subset of the sample space. So an event is any collection of outcomes in that sample space. Find the probability for event A. So easiest way to do probability is to do the, the number of events number of possibilities for the event that you're interested in out of the total number in the sample space. So in this case, we've got three possibilities for event A out of a total of six in the sample space. So our probability would be three out of six. I know that could reduce, doesn't matter, I'm just gonna leave it three six. Find the outcomes for event B, this time event B is rolling a number less than four. So the outcomes for event B would be rolling a one, two, or three. And notice it just says less than four, not less than or equal to, so I'm not going to include the four. Probability of event B would be what? So how many ways can that occur? Three out of how many were in the sample space? Six altogether. Okay, let's take a look at a different example. So find the, a family has two children. Find the probability of event A that they have one boy and one girl. So let's first list the sample space. So the sample space is all of the possibilities for the way this could occur for these two children in this family. So they could have a boy first and then a boy second. They could have a boy and then a girl. They could have a girl and then they could have a boy or they could have two girls. Okay, so the question says find the probability that they have one boy and one girl. So the probability of event A, that they have one boy and one girl, would be the number of ways this could occur out of the total number in the sample space. So the number of ways this could occur are two different ways. They could have a boy and then a girl right here, or they could have a girl and then a boy. So that would be two out of a total possibility scenario of so it's a 50% chance, if you want to think of it that way, or one-half or two-fourths. It doesn't matter how you write the answer. Okay? Combining events. So combining events when you see the word and. An event belonging to A and B means that it must belong to both A 
and B. So if you hear the word and, that means that it has to belong, whatever the event is, has to belong to both A and B. If you see the word or, that's a little bit different. So if an event belongs to both A or B, that means it could belong to A only or B only or it could belong to both. So a little bit more to consider when you see the word or. So let's use a deck of cards as our example, okay? If we draw one card randomly from a standard 52 card playing deck, what is the probability that it will be a club? Um, if you're not sure how a deck of cards looks, I'll help you with, with what to expect in the deck, so you don't need to stress too much about that, as long as we understand what how to calculate the probabilities. So for a 52 card deck, the probability of getting a club, so a deck of cards has four suits, club, uh, spade, heart, and diamond, and each of those suits contains 13 cards. So if we want to know the probability of selecting a club, so I'm going to call this, um, I'm going to call it C for club. They didn't give me a name for it, so I'm going to use C for the event. There would be 13 clubs in the deck, so that means there are 13 ways I could select a club out of the total of 52. Um, you can leave this as is, or you can reduce it to 1 over 4. A black card, so the deck, half of the deck is black and half of the deck is red. So the probability of selecting a black card would be half of the deck, so half of the deck is 26 cards, out of the total 52. Keep remember part over whole, that's the way all these probabilities are going to work. And of course that reduces to one half, but you don't have to reduce it. Probability of selecting a 10, so there are four suits and each of those suits has a 10, it has a 1, 1 through 10 basically, and then some face cards, a jack, queen, or a king. Um, and then the ace, of course. But the probability of selecting a 10, there are four 10s in the deck, so that would be 4 out of 52. A red 10, so the probability of selecting a red 10. So of those four 10s, half are red and half are black. So that means there are two red 10s in the entire deck, so 2 out of 52. The probability of selecting a face card, so a face card would include a jack, queen, or a king. So each suit contains a jack, queen, or a king. So the probability of selecting a face card, I'm going to use F for face card. There are four suits, and each one has three face cards. So how many face cards are there in the deck? Four suits, three face cards. So that would be 12 face cards in the entire deck out of 52. Probability of selecting an ace. So each suit contains one ace. So that means there are four aces in the entire deck out of 52. <clears throat> Part G says, if one card is selected from a well-shuffled deck of 52 cards, what is the probability that the card will be a spade or a heart or a diamond? So let's just start with that. So the probability that we select a spade, I'm going to use S for spade, or a heart or a diamond. Okay, so let's think about each of those events. There are 13 spades in the deck, so that would be 13 out of 52. There's 13 hearts in the deck, so we're going to add that, and that gives us another 13 out of 52. And there's 13 diamonds in the deck. So 13 out of 52, again, gives us a total of 39 out of 52. The complement, what is the probability of the complement? So the probability of the complement, and I'm not using very good notation here because of the way I wrote this, so I'm just going to say um, complement of the above event here. That would be 1 minus the probability of the event itself, and if we get a common denominator, this gives us 13 out of 52. Um, the complement here would be the probability of not selecting a spade, heart, or diamond. Now, if you know the deck, that means that the only thing left would be a club, so those would be the probability of selecting clubs. But again, think of complements in the negative. It's the probability of not selecting one of those, one of those three suits. Okay, let's take a look at this example. So the following contingency table summarizes... Uh, results from a fictitious survey that asked about a political party. So the political party affiliation and who you supported in the 2016 presidential election. All right, so this is called a contingency table 
Um, I don't know if we've used that term before in this course. Maybe early in Chapter 1 we talked about it a little bit, but it basically gives you different scenarios or breakdowns for this survey data. So what you would want to do in, these, in the total row and the total column is you would add up the numbers going across. So 502 plus 224 plus 204, for example, is 930 people that voted for Clinton. The Trump row would be 1,045. The other row would be 827. And then going down the columns, we have 821 Democrats, 1,160 Republicans, and then other affiliation is 821. If we add up the total row on the bottom or the total column on the top, whichever way we do it, that'll give us the total in our entire survey, and that's 2802. All right, so complete the con contingency table. There's our numbers. What is the probability of randomly selecting a person who is a Democrat? So relative to the entire survey, what is the probability of randomly selecting a Democrat? I'm going to use D for the notation here. So probably of selecting a Democrat. Well, how many Democrats total were there in the survey? There were 821 out of the total number of respondents, 2802. Um, you can make it a decimal if you want. You can reduce it possibly. I don't care. I'm just going to leave it as an unsimplified fraction. The probability of randomly selecting a Trump voter. So relative to the entire survey, what is the probability of selecting somebody who is a Trump voter? So we're going to look at our Trump column, or Trump row rather, and there were 1,045 people in the survey who selected Trump out of a total 2802 in the survey. Part D, what is the probability of selecting a person that is a Democrat and a Clinton voter? So what that means is they have to be in both categories. They have to be a Democrat and a Clinton voter. So you're going to hone in on that one cell in, in the chart that represents that group of people. So those would be the people that are the intersection of the Democrat and the Clinton voters. So that would be this little cell right here. So let's write it as the probability of selecting a Democrat and a Clinton voter. There's, there's other notation we're going to learn later. I'm just going to write out the word and for right now. But that would be the group 502 out of the total survey, 2802. Now E says, what is the probability of selecting a person who is a Democrat or a Republican? So that means they could be a Democrat only, a Republican only, or both. However, in this survey, can you be both a Democrat and a Republican? No, you cannot. You're either a Democrat or you're a Republican. So the total number of Democrats are 821. The total number of Republicans are 1160. So let's write this out. The probability of being a Democrat or a Republican will be, oops, let me go back and look at the chart here, will be, uh, let's see, 821 plus 1160. So 821 out of the total, 2802 are the Democrats, plus 1160 out of the total are your Republicans. So that would be a total of 1981 out of the entire sample. Okay? Now, let's read F, and I want you to compare Part F to Part E, because this is a really important distinction that we're going to have to remember to make. What is the probability that a person is either a Republican or a Trump voter? So here's the thing you want to think about. Can somebody be both? Can somebody be both a Republican and a Trump voter in this survey? Let's go back and look. So we've got our Republican column is 1160. So this column right here. We've got our Trump row is 1045. Is there some overlap between those two people? And the answer is yes. It's this group right here. That's where the overlap is. So when we figure out the probability here, the or probability, we're going to have to consider this group that's contained in, or the small part of the group that's contained in both groups, Republican and Trump. So let me show you how we're going to write this. Let me come back down here. So the probability of selecting a Republican or a Trump voter. So the probability of selecting Republicans, let's start with that, is 1160. So 1160 Republicans 
relative the, to the entire sample, plus the probability of selecting a Trump voter would be, look at the row for that, would be 1,045. Get rid of this mark here. So 1,045 out of the sample. Now, the ones who are in both, if we don't make it, if we have to, if we got to consider the ones who are in both, because right now, this group of, oops, this group of 524 people are being counted in both, both columns, or both groups, rather. So we have to do something with that 524, because right now they're being counted twice in the Republican column and the Trump row. So the way we're going to handle this is we're going to subtract that overlapping group. So that 524, we're going to subtract that off, and that's going to get us our final probability. So the numbers here, if we simplify, it's 1681 out of 2802. So this is a really important concept here. Um, whether or not the events are mutually exclusive. So in part E, these events were mutually exclusive. What does that mean? Let me write this down. So mutually, let me write this out, mutually exclusive. So events in which there are no common outcomes or events that cannot occur at the same time are considered mutually exclusive events. If they can occur at the same time, then they are not mutually exclusive. So in this previous example, E was mutually exclusive. Why was E mutually exclusive? So part E, that you are a Democrat or a Republican. Why is that mutually exclusive? Because you cannot be both. You cannot be both a Democrat and a Republican. You have to pick one. And so those events were mutually exclusive. The event that was not mutually exclusive was the event for part F. So not mutually exclusive was part F, that you were a Republican voter or a Trump voter, because those can occur at the same time. We did have a group that was both Republican and a Trump voter, so those were not mutually exclusive. When you see the word or in a question and they're asking about probability, you need to start by asking yourself if the events are mutually exclusive. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more in the next video.